Um, hi everyone, my name is David Bushman. I'm television curator at the Museum of Television and Radio and I want to welcome all of you to the museum's 23rd annual William Paley Television Festival. That clip that you just saw is from Route 66, which is one of the shows that um, the creator, Eric Kripke, of, um, of Supernatural um, often cites as one of his influences and that explains why we picked it. That's part of our collection. We have 120,000 television and radio uh, programs in our collection and I would encourage all of you to visit the museum in Beverly Hills and in New York when you're there. Um, tonight we're really excited to be honoring Supernatural which was named one of the top five new series of 2005 by Entertainment Weekly. Supernatural is uh, a vibrant, fresh, exciting show that combines all sorts of genre elements, family drama, comedy, suspense, and on top of that, it just scares the hell out of you. <laughs> I really want to thank Warner Brothers for all they did in helping make this night happen, particularly the PR department, Holly Allis and Winston Cito. Thank, thank you very much. Um, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to um, introduce right up front the cast and the creative team, our panelists for the evening, introduce them very briefly. Um, Eric's going to say a few words about what you're going to see, then we're going to watch an episode of the program, which Eric will talk about, then we'll bring the panelists back up, I'll ask some questions, and then you guys are on. So start thinking of questions now, okay? Um, so let me start with the panelists' intros. First. Uh, one of the producers of Supernatural, please welcome Peter Johnson. Uh, next we have co-executive producer and director Kim Manners. Next, we have co-executive producer and writer John Scheiban. Next, he plays Dean Winchester. Please welcome Jensen Ackles. Next, Sam Winchester. Please welcome Jared Padalecki. <laughs> Next, the executive producer and director, Robert Singer. Finally, the man whose vision uh, created Supernatural is the creator, executive producer, and writer. Please welcome Eric Kripke. Hey, everybody. Um, thank you so much uh, for coming. Uh, it's a little uh, overwhelming and, and amazing, uh, quite frankly. This is, to my knowledge, I mean, the first gathering of any Supernatural fans anywhere. So thank you to you and give yourself a round of applause. Um, just a quick story from the set of Supernatural, because it just happened last night, uh, which is they were, uh, they shoot up in Vancouver and uh, they were shooting up at Stanley Park, or about to begin production, which is a, a public park up in Vancouver. Um, and uh, uh, we're about to start filming when they got a call that uh, there was a man about 100, 200 yards from the film company uh, with a handgun. And uh, they called, you know, Jared and Jensen and said, you know, don't come to set. There's a man with a handgun. And, and they shut down the whole production for two hours. They called in the police. They called in the SWAT team. Uh, they stormed. This is all true. Very true. This all just happened last night. Uh, they all stormed Stanley, you know, SWAT team stormed Stanley Park uh, looking for this man with a gun. Uh, and it turned out to be a uh, member of our special effects crew. <laughs> so... Good times from the set of Supernatural. Um, anyway, so uh, I'm supposed to introduce the episode, so let me, uh, let me do that. Uh, the episode we're showing tonight is uh, Scarecrow. Um, all right, Scarecrow fans in the house. 
Uh, Scarecrow uh, was written by the uh, very brilliant uh, John Scheiben. Uh, so round of applause for John. And it was directed by the very brilliant Kim Manners. <clears throat> Um, and so the reason uh, we chose Scarecrow is we sort of felt it was uh, just a, a good mix of sort of everything that the show is about. Um, you know, we think there's really some good drama between the brothers. We think there's some good comedy. Uh, we think there's, you know, good mythology about dad. And this is the character, this is the episode that introduces Meg, which people online had problems with, I seem to <laughs> remember. Um, and uh, and it's you know just we think a, a scary uh, damn good episode and 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 based on a, a, a good series of uh, you know very fun urban legends about scarecrows and so I'll stop rattling on enjoy scarecrow we'll talk after thank you. Um, are there any X file fans out there in the audience? <laughs> So uh, every time I see this episode, I feel like shaking Dean and saying, what are you doing trusting the cigarette-smoking man? But, um, I'm going to bring our panelists back up on stage. Um, our first panelist is co-executive producer and director on Supernatural. He's directed nearly 300 hours of television, including 53 episodes of The X-Files, which he also produced. Please welcome Kim Manners. Um, our next panelist is a co-executive producer and writer on Supernatural. He began his career as a staff writer on The X-Files, writing or co-writing over 20 episodes and eventually serving as executive producer. He was also co-creator and executive producer of The Lone Gunman and supervising producer of Harsh Realm and has written for and produced Star Trek Enterprise, Threat Matrix, and USA Network's Frankenstein. Please welcome John Scheiben. Our next panelist portrays Dean, <laughs> wise-cracking older Winchester brother. Before Supernatural, he was <laughs> before <laughs> before Supernatural, he was familiar to WB viewers as Jason Teague on Smallville. I don't know if I'm going to get through these intros. He had a recurring role on Dawson's Creek and was a regular on Dark Angel. He, re <laughs> he received three Daytime Emmy nominations for his role on Days. <laughs> please, please welcome Jensen Ackles. Um, our next panelist portrays Sam, the rebellious, <laughs> rebellious younger Winchester brother. Before Supernatural, he was best known as Rory's boyfriend, Dean on Gilmore Girls. His, 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 his film credits include. His film credits include House of Wax, Cheaper by the Dozen, Flight of the Phoenix. Please welcome Jared Padalecki. <laughs> Our next panelist executive produces Supernatural and directs episodes of the series. Formerly, <laughs> formerly vice president of NBC Drama Development, he later teamed with Daniel Blatt to produce films and TV series including V, The Final Battle, and Stephen King's Cujo. On his own, he has executive produced Midnight Caller, Lois, Clark, Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman, and Reasonable Doubts, which he also created. Please welcome Robert Singer. Um, our final panelist today is the creator of Supernatural, in addition to executive producing and writing for the series. His previous TV credits include 
the WB series Tarzan. He also wrote and co-produced. <laughs> He also wrote and co-produced the feature film Boogeyman. Please welcome Eric Kripke. Okay, I'll start with a few questions before we open it to you guys. Um, Eric, the first one would be for you. I'm just kind of curious how, how this, uh, the idea for this series, um, the genesis of it, and, and how it evolved from concept to uh, what we see on the screen. Um, I, uh, for a really long time, I wanted to do a show about uh, American folklore and urban legends, it's sort of, kind of a subject that you know, even back to elementary school, I've been you know kind of obsessed with. As a matter of fact, the very my very very first TV pitch when I first started in town when I was 23, 24 was a, a, an urban legend show, and I kept trying different versions of it and kept getting smacked down. Um, I tried to do it as an anthology, and then I had this idea of like a bunch of reporters in a van, like Scooby Doo style. <laughs> Uh, all these sort of terrible ideas, and then uh, and then I was you know working with Warner Brothers and and had just come off of uh, uh, Darzan, and <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and they said you know what do you what what show would you want to do? And I said well an urban legend show. And they said well what what's the concept? And I had this really long elaborate storyline that I'd spent weeks and weeks on uh, about a reporter, um, and it was almost exactly uh, Night Stalker, which is hilarious. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and uh, they, they kind of looked at me, and they were like, nah. They're like, you know, any other, you know, what else? And I said, well, because I, I literally scribbled it in my notebook the day before, which was, I said, well, you know, it could be like Route 66, like two guys on a road trip. And they're like, we love that. Do that. <laughs> and I, I, so it just kind of came out of nowhere and just sort of uh, developed from there. And, and it turned out to be just the, the, the right uh, you know, the right way into this show, because they can just drive it, you know, the boys can just drive in and out of a different horror movie every week, so. Did you, did you um, at that point, know, who, in terms of characters, who those two guys were? I mean, how did the whole, this whole family element, which is so important to the show, I mean, even, um, you know, Jared says to, to the girl in this episode, uh, I've got to go back because it's my family. How did that whole family aspect um, just, you know, you, you write what you know, and, and I'm, I'm from a very uh, close-knit uh, family, and I have a big brother, um, and, uh, you know, and I have, you know, a lot of, you know, really great friends, and, and just, you know, sort of the way guys talk and the way they communicate without ever really communicating anything, and, um, and uh, so it just kind of, it, it kind of grew, grew out of that, and, uh, so I knew I wanted to do, you know, uh, you know, in terms of the characters, I knew I wanted, you know, the the little brother to, you know, be conflicted and have a lot of, you know, a lot of the angst and problems, which I threw right to Jared. Um, and I wanted a, and, and I wanted a big brother to just be a total smartass. I mean, that's how I started, you know. Um, and, and so, you know, and, and, and it's, and it's, you know, with a show like this, that's you know, the uh, with the genre and it's sort of out there. It's it's it really needs like a grounding influence and to to ground the show into family and elements of family, um, and that you know the care that these brothers have for each other uh, uh, really helps us because mm -hmm. these two guys. <laughs> big hug, big hug. Part of the guys we want. Yeah, because um, these two guys. I mean, the the relationship they have. I mean, sometimes we have you know good subject matter and sometimes, you know, we don't. Um, <laughs> but, the, but the relationship of the brothers, these, these two actors always sees us through, so. Did, um, were you familiar with their work? Um, or did you just bring in a ton of actors to audition for the roles? Uh, we auditioned everybody in town, um, as you always do kind of on these pilots. Uh -huh. um, my, uh, my wife was quite the Gilmore Girls fan, uh -huh. so. I, uh, I knew. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, knew, uh, I, I knew Jared's work, and Jensen, uh, our director, David Nutter, uh, who uh -huh. directed the pilot, um, knew Jensen from, uh, either, was it Dark Angel? Probably. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he knew him from Dark Angel, and so, uh, Dark Angel! Jensen and Dark Angel! <laughs> I mean, come on! 
And uh, so when we were, you know, when we were casting the characters, it was, it was David Nutter who said, you know, we have, to, we have to fly down Jensen, who was up shooting Smallville at the time, so he wasn't really in the, in the, in the pilot pool. And, you know, thank God we did, because he walked, actually the story, which was funny, is Jensen walked in the room and, and met with us, and, and, and David and, and Peter Johnson and I, and, and we talked to him and talked to him, and we walked out the door, and we looked at each other, and we were so excited, and we were like, we found him, we found Sam. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get flown down. I didn't drive <laughs> yeah. myself. Yeah. So yeah. And, uh, I wanted that to be now. And it, and it was and so you know these things just kind of form as as puzzle pieces come together. And it wasn't until we met Jared that we were like, well, that's Sam. And we're like, and then you know Jensen could be Dean. And then it all just kind of you know it all kind of came together from there. That's real interesting. Well, how about you guys, Jared and, and Jensen? Can you? Tell us I'll let Jensen take that. From your, oh, you uh, go ahead. Oh, Jensen, that's no, no. that's totally you. What was, Honestly, what's the what's the exact question? The question is. <laughs> is oh, spelling bee. Can you use the word spell like, uh, Use that in a sentence. Leper. Leopard. <laughs> Leopard. No, no, no. The question uh, was, uh, can you talk about the audition process from the your perspective? Well, it's interesting actually for me hearing it from Eric's perspective. Um, I, uh, I had obviously been working with Warner Brothers for Gilmore Girls, and um, the five years prior to doing the show, I'd worked on Gilmore Girls and sort of developed a relationship with um, some of the people at the Warner Brothers offices, and had kind of uh, heard about a few of the pilots coming out, and I read this one in particular, and I really enjoyed the, the characters, and it really struck me as something that I remembered hearing sort of a one sentence breakdown of like, it's kind of uh, supernatural, it's called supernatural. <laughs> and I was thinking like, great, Charmed or Buffy, which are all great shows, but not the show I wanted to be a part of. You know, I didn't want to do Roswell or Charmed or Buffy. And then when I read it, I was like, wow, this is, this is very interesting and, and so much more than just like, ooh, scary show. So What, what uh, appealed to you about it? Well, I sort of, uh, I grew up son of an English teacher, so she was always big and he, she actually taught Heroes, Myths and Legends, so I was familiar with the mythology and sort of uh, the Joseph Campbell taught teachings, the taught teachings of Joseph Campbell. <laughs> and uh, yeah, didn't, didn't rub off that she was an English Didn't teacher. rub off, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, it didn't, it didn't. I just worked till 4.30 this morning in Vancouver, so I'm a little interesting that you mentioned Joseph aware. Campbell, because there's a little bit of the reluctant hero. In Very much. Character. I mean, there's more than, there's so much more than just the reluctant hero. I mean, when you get into the archetypes, there's sort of, each script is just bursting at the seams with archetypes. And, you know, last thing I think these people want to hear is me going to an <laughs> explanation of, I love the script, I love the character. Did, um, <laughs> so... We're doing a, we're doing a, a, a answer. I'm awake. Okay. So, uh, well, so your agent sent you the script and you were, you were auditioning for Sam all along. Uh, right, right. I, I guess, I guess... Where the, where the process, or how the process, where it wasn't reached me was read the script, see if you like the character, see if you like the script. It was sort of like, do you, you know, do you mesh with this, do you feel you can mesh with this script? And I felt I could, and so I went and I, and I met some of the guys, and I re-met Nutter, and, you know, sat in an office with, who was it, Kripke, was it? Was, uh, me, Nutter, Peter Johnson, we were at the uh, <laughs> Wonderland <laughs> offices, and, uh, uh, yeah, and he, he came in, he had such energy and, and just so uh, lived the character, just so was the guy. You know, it's a cliche to say that, but he really was, so it was, a, it was an easy choice. And did you feel real good about it? to say that, but he really was, so it was, a, it was an easy choice. And did you feel real good about it coming out? Uh, well, yeah, I, it, was, it was by no means that short a process, you know, I mean, that was sort of the beginning of a week or two week long finding of scripts and characters and I think the script is still being rewritten and I remember I'd seen a script and they're like this is changing you know read the script but it has nothing to do with this it's right yeah so much it's which true. is much like it, it is nowadays you know we get a script and they're like okay we're shooting this in a week but it will be a completely you know it's just like it, it always can get better and and everybody's always working hard up to the very last second you know until they call action people are working here people are working in Canada just you know sprinting okay Jensen what was your experience pretty much the same <laughs> <laughs> uh, well said, Jensen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, like like Eric said, they they had originally brought me in for uh, for the role of Sam, and um, I I knew David Nutter very well. Uh, I'd, I'd worked on uh, uh, testing for some uh, a number of pilots 
um, before that. So I, I felt very comfortable with him and with his recommendation of me coming in, and, and he felt good about it. And uh, I had a conversation with him on the phone before I came, before I came in. And just he kind of gave me a spiel about Sam and, and, uh, and what he thought. And, uh, and then I read the script, and, and I was just like, what about Dean? <laughs> I like Dean. <laughs> He's funny. <laughs> and uh, it's, but I, you know, I, I studied for Sam, and, and I went in there, and I, I actually kind of studied for Dean a little bit too, just in case. And um, I went in there and I read for Sam, and and, and uh, like Eric said, it, and they were like, you know, they were pleased with it, um, and then. Went home that evening and got a phone call and he said, well, uh, uh, there's this guy, Jared uh, Pada, Pada something. That's a pass. Uh, Pada something. Pada yeah. something. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and they really are liking him for, uh, for one of the brothers. And I'm like, okay. So of course I look him up online and I'm like. He thought I was hot. He's, he's... <laughs> this guy's smoking hot. I can't <laughs> play his brother. And... Um, no, and, 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 and then they said, they said, but would, they'd like to bring you back in for Dean, and I, of course, was very excited about it, and I came back in and, and uh, I was thrilled, so uh, that's kind of how it all so, so by the time you guys actually performed together, you had already had the parts. They weren't auditioning. Well, no, we, had, we, didn't, have to, we didn't have it uh, Did we? officially. No, we had, they, we had to do we the, were the... They were the only actors we brought in to network, because you have to have a network the formality audition. Of the network. It's usually a really terrifying process of yeah. sort of... Yeah these guys and gals that you audition with all year long and it's five people that you're very, very afraid of sitting in the room with you going for the same part. And when we got there, it was like, hey, hey, where is everybody? No, there is nobody. Just you and me, pal. Right. And yeah, so, and we started typing numbers down on a page. And yeah, well, we went in and, and, and that was, yeah, that was the first time we actually met and then we hmm. did the scene together uh, for a, a, a room full of executives and uh, right. that was that. Okay. And we've hated each other ever since. Yeah. <laughs> I poisoned your waters. So. <laughs> how about everyone else on the panel? Kim, we could start with you and Ben. Talk about how you became involved with uh, Supernatural. I read for Sam. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did everybody read for Sam? <laughs> Uh, David Netter, who directed the pilot, is a good friend. He did season one of X-Files, and um, he called and asked if I would do a favor and uh, come in and do one episode, because I was kind of semi-retired after X-Files. Uh, very semi-retired. <laughs> and I came in and did a show uh, called Dead in the Water. I uh, enjoyed myself, fell in love with uh, Jan and Dean, or is it Sam and Dean? Um <laughs> uh, and I was driving home to my home in Missouri, and they called me and said, uh, we want you to come on as a uh, part of the team. And I turned around, and here I am. So and I'm God. having a good time. Yeah. Thank God. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what we do without uh, Kim up there. He's unbelievable. Yeah. Kim, uh, John? I know what you do. You get another guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, there is no other guy. No. Not true. No there other is guy. no other guy named no. Kim. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 You know, if this whole thing fails, you guys can go right into stand-up. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to stand up to him. Or <laughs> stand up on apple boxes all the time. <laughs> I'm pretty lazy. I'd rather sit. John, how'd meanwhile, you... what, what meanwhile, he, what he what he doesn't know, what he didn't know about this whole process is that after we had him direct, uh, I guess that was our fourth episode. We had the pilot yep. with David Nutter, Wendigo with David Nutter, Hookman with David Jackson, and then, and they... then Kim came in, and immediately, I think, from day one, we were on the phone with everybody. We were on the phone with Peter and with Eric, and saying, "This guy is incredible. This, who is this guy?" And David Nutter had sort of given him this very sort of mysterious you'll love Kim, kind of sentence at the very beginning. Because we were going over this Jedi. list of seven, very Jedi. Yeah, it was like, love who is Kim, who is this guy? Oh, I knew him from this. Who is Kim Manners? You'll love Kim Manners. And sure enough, <laughs> we were like, what? And, um, and, he, and he came on and he was just incredible. <laughs> and he was just incredible. And um, can, I, can I borrow? Yeah. And, uh, wow. And so we, uh, we, uh, we basically begged and pleaded to get him... Um, a job, just a job. A job. That's all yeah. I wanted. He was hungry. He was, you know, he kept trying to bite my arm. I was really worried. 
Yeah, I don't want to embarrass Kim, but what was so incredible about him? About, about, about him. who? Well, I, I think oh. that I think that uh, uh, Jared and I just we, we just responded well to him. I mean, he he directed in a fashion that that uh, we really liked, and um, you know, it was kind of a set where guys could be guys, and, and he wasn't someone who who directed you know behind a screen with a telephone somewhere in L.A. and was like you know doing over and over and then a close up and a close up and let's get out of here and move on to the next set. He was he was in there, and and you know a, a story about another uh, episode that he directed, Bugs. Uh, this was a, a a scene where we had to get in to a room with. Sorry. Yeah, no. It's, I mean, it's you know we get in this this tiny little room with sixty five thousand bees, and uh, the whole camera crew and the sound crew and everybody's got full bee outfits on, and then they're like, "All right, Jared Jensen, hop on in." <laughs> And, uh, and don't swat them because it makes them angry. And, yeah. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll give it to Kim. He said, uh, you know what, if, if, if you guys don't have bee suits on, I'm not either. And he went in there with a, a shorts and a t-shirt and a monitor. Wow. And sat down on a box and directed us from inside the room with bees crawling all over our faces. Yeah. It's just, it's, it was that, it's that kind of relationship with Kim. John, how'd you get involved? Uh, I was going through the uh, annual ritual of staffing season. Uh, I had a, a pilot that didn't go, so I was available and reading all the pilots and taking meetings and and read the script and loved it uh, and met Eric and loved him. Aww. And I know. And John's my guy. Yeah, it's, not, it's, it's true. Um, and uh, I, there are a lot of uh, you know, I, I spend a long time on the X-Files and uh, I'm offered a lot of scary television shows every year. It's like, can, will you do this with yeah. you? And this one just struck me right away, uh, especially when I finally saw the, the, the cut of the pilot, because it had those two things that I think you need to have a successful show like this. One is a great franchise, which is the engine that runs the show. The idea that the two brothers on the road trip with a very personal agenda. Uh, is just great, and you can imagine, I can see instantly five years of, of suffering for these guys in, uh, in episode after episode. Uh, and the second thing, honestly, is, is, uh, is casting and chemistry, and chemistry is something you can't manufacture, and these guys have it, and they're so great to write for, and they're so fun to write for. <laughs> Worth a try. Worth a try. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, yeah, I'm coming on. Okay. Bob, how about you? Uh, can I just watch them? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they had actually made this pilot, and uh, I, I saw the pilot and uh, really liked it a lot. And I think uh, what the studio wanted was, um, after they saw it and it got picked up, and the studio at one point probably said to themselves, we're... <laughs> You can't get anything done. This is what it's like to direct them, too. Uh, uh, the studio said, well, we, we can't give 40 plus million dollars to Eric Kripke. Yeah. <laughs> Very true. And let him run wild. So they said, what we need is, you know, some. This is so hard. <laughs> People are very um, so they thought they needed some, uh, you know, a, 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 an experienced hand to guide the young man through these rocky waters. The young, the young man, of course, felt, what do I need this old fart for? No way. <laughs> uh, anyway, we met, and we met a number of times, and um, finally Eric got uh, comfortable enough with me for, uh, for us to join up and, uh, and partner on this thing. And... Um, it's interesting because, I mean, we are sort of different generations and, and we approach um, drama in kind of a different way. Um, but as we sort of work together, we found that uh, we, always, we, we really arrive at the same place, even though kind of the, the methods are a little different of how we get there. And it's, uh, Can you explain what you mean when you say that coming from different generations you approach drama in a different ways? Well, I don't know if that's a generational thing, but I'm very... Uh, Sober. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Drunk. There's that, yeah. yeah. Well, um, it, it, this is so boring, but uh, for um, I, I kind of come in everything from a character stand 
point of view. It's, it's all about character to me, and I like to let the plot work itself out given what the characters are, are going to do. And what I'm interested in the scenes is how, the, you know, it drives the plot, but I'm most interested in how the characters react to it. Um, and, and, and so the stories I do tend to get a little like, like this, but the character stuff is probably interesting. Eric really works very, very hard on the stories uh, and gets the plot down and knows that once his plot is good, the, the, the character stuff will come naturally to that. So we sort of g go like this when we're in the room together and we'll, we'll arrive at that place which both things are serviced and, and, and I think you know, we're really in sort of one voice now that we, we, we rarely disagree on stuff and it's, uh, you know, I've worked alone for a long time so it's kind of really cool to have a partner. Yeah, and to, to blow smoke up his ass for a minute. Um, he brings a depth uh, uh, and, and, and maturity of, char of character, of just depth to the drama that I could not do. You know, it, me, on, me alone, like, is boogeyman. <laughs> and, 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 like, all of a sudden with him, like, you know, we have a, a, a show where you have these characters that are psychologically rich and true, and, 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 and Bob is, is behind huge amounts of that. So uh, we, the show would not succeed uh, at all without him. So. Come on. Oh. 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 Come on. Give him a you kiss. Guys can do it. No, yeah. right. Right. Let me ask one more question long? before yeah. I yeah. before I open this up. But this is for the writers mostly, um, which I guess is Eric and John. But um, you know, Eric, you've been quoted um, as saying that uh, you know this show differs from a lot of the other uh, suspense or supernatural shows that you said there because you don't want to get involved so much in those long drawn out stories or, or the mythology so much as you just, I don't know whether these are accurate quotes, but you want to um, just focus on scaring people and on the, on the urban uh, folklore and, and, and so on and just scaring people. But um, I think, I, I, I speaking for myself and, and maybe some people out here too, I find the mythology uh, with the, the kids with their mom and their, mm -hmm. their dad and uh, um, you know, one of the really compelling parts of the story. So um, I'm wondering how you just, and, I, and you know, you start to see, even with the last episode that, that aired last Tuesday, you're starting to see you guys are coming back to that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering how do you decide when it's time to sort of veer away from what X-Files used to call the monster of the week story and come back to the mythology of the show. So it's really for John and Eric. How do you decide when it's time to do that? Or, John? Uh, two things. I mean, a lot of painful uh, hair-pulling discussions and arguments and when should we and when shouldn't we. But part of it is driven, too, by just the nature of television. You want to save some of your big moments for sweeps. And so you kind of work the season around that. It works at actually a very nice uh, five or six episodes that are non-mythology, and then you can, you can pull the mythology back and, uh, and, again, do the nature of television. You want to end the season with some something astounding and uh, also going to back to what Bob was saying the mythology is all about character it's all about what the boys are going through and family and so that's where we are going to head when we want to do something spectacular so yeah we we had a we have and surprisingly have stuck to it we have a a, a, a mythology plan for season one we also have you know god willing a pickup we have mythology plans for season two and season three but we have this plan of where the story goes in, in yeah. On the CW. On the CW. When do we get to see this? Um, and, and so, you know, it, it was sort of the plan, which is the first seven, or se about really first seven episodes. You wanted to be these self-enclosed stories so you could kind of pick up new viewers and then you start threading in a little bit more mythology. But I think it's a balance because, I mean, it's my own just, you know, kind of personal taste, which is, I mean, I like, a, you know, I want a satisfying story every week too. and and. Um, you know, I mean, Lost is an untouchable show. I mean, it's, an, it, it's a brilliant and unbelievable show, but I, I, I find the endless mystery, f my own taste, frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if you're going to give ongoing mystery, all right, so people who believe, and if you're going to give ongoing mystery, at least give, like, a rollicking, badass story apart from it that can, can have a beginning, middle, and end, and you can be satisfied, and the good guys can win, and you, and you can have the experience of being told a story and then, you know, thread in the ongoing mystery. So I think it's, it's, it's keeping a lot of different plates spinning, and it's not, it shouldn't be any one thing or, or another. Do you know where this story ends? Um, I do, actually, yeah. Does anyone else on this panel know where the story ends? Yeah, but you we do. tell you we have to kill you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's hard it, because you never know when you're going to get canceled or if you're going to go, you know, 
37 years like gun smoke or something. Uh, oh, God, please. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> the boys are in walk Sam? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> the, the, they'll finish up the season and then they'll slowly die. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so, but, but yes, we have, you know, really a, a, a five, if, if, if I could somehow find out what the last season was going to be or, 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 or a five, six year plan, I mean, I sort of know the, you know, the, the final, you know, battle as it were that, that all shapes up and, uh, uh, but yeah, you know, you sort of We're gonna have to wait. Yeah. Okay. Let's take some questions from the audience. Um, I'm going to call on two people. Um, first question, a second question, please wait for the mic because this event is being taped. So we need to be able to hear you. Uh, okay, there's one all the way in the back over there, and then there's one in a green shirt right down here. We can start down here with the green shirt and then go to the back question. Sorry, I had to take out my gum. Hi. Um, I'm, let me just say, I'm originally from Sacramento, so I'm, I wanted to know if there's any significance with their dad, John, being in Sacramento twice, or just random, or spoilery, or... You wrote John. it, John. Why is it in Sacramento? I don't want to it's... give it away yet. <laughs> so yes, there is. So there's... <laughs> I'm not going to tell you either. I want to know. Yeah, why? After. 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 Oh, thanks after. a lot. Tickets for a Sacramento yeah, Kings game. So there, there, the answer is that there is, but you're not going to say what it is. Exactly. Okay. And speaking of location, is there any significance to Lawrence, Kansas? That it started in Lawrence, Kansas? Um, uh, I would say, well, uh, uh, if anyone does a... Uh, uh, In other words, yes. Yes. <laughs> there, there is, and the, and, the, and the one thing I'd say is because we tend to be really research-oriented in our show huh? and, and about American urban legends, and there's a, there's a very famous uh, urban legend uh, near Lawrence, Kansas. Um, That's that, about uh, factors. Yeah. yeah, you know, if you guys go home, do Google searches on Lawrence, right. Kansas, some stuff will come up. Okay. And, do you guys know what it is? Jared and Jensen? I don't think I've ever told you. Yeah, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Gosh. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm deciding when I'm going to tell Kripke what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly. Tell them okay. Anyway. In the back all the way. Hi. Uh, just want to say I'm from Texas, too. So. Woo! Woo! <laughs> anyway, I had a question um, for everybody. What urban legend or folklore really does scare you guys? Kim? Um... Nothing scares me. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I, I direct yeah, television. I believe it. And I, so, you know, if, if, you, if you can live through that, nothing scares you. Really. Good answer. Yeah, yeah. well, it's true. <laughs> what scares you, John? Late scripts. You do, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you do, Kim. When you call me and say, where's the damn script? <laughs> That's frightening. Any, any urban... What about you guys? I'm dealing with them all season, man. Yeah. <laughs> all all of them. What about those bees? You know, yeah, I have bees. A, I, That's what I'm I'll, I'll say something. I, uh, my daddy used to make me watch a show called Shadow Man or something when I was growing up, and it was about a shadow that lived under this kid's bed, and uh, he was sort of... What's that? <laughs> and anyways, and uh, it was his buddy. And he's here he wasn't tonight. very popular yeah. in school, and so the Shadow Man started kind of getting all the bullies for him, and then one day came another kid, Shadow Man, and got him. Yeah, it's probably not as scary as it is. Go ahead. Someone has to give her a straight answer. Uh, yeah. Ho hook Man freaked me out when I was a kid. The killer with the hook. All the different stories of the killer with the hook. Of, uh, you know, the, the, the aren't, you glad, aren't you glad you didn't turn on the light? I thought it was really cool. And there's uh, the licked hand. Have you ever heard the licked hand, which is a really cool one? And, um, so, like, that, that was always, you know, really sort of, sort of freaky for me. Okay, let's take two more questions. Um, we'll get this one down here, and uh, there's one all the way in the back, right, right next to you. Right. Go ahead. Um, in the pilot, we know that uh, when Sam wanted to go to college, John told him to get lost. And um, he's in his, presumably his fourth year, because he's interviewing for law school. Um, but he says that he hasn't talked to Dean in two years. Is there an answer to what happened two years ago? Uh, you mean, is that... I actually, Eric, I, I have an answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I know you're supposed to, you know, do what Scheiben does, which is kind of go, you'll find out. <laughs> but, 
uh, fact of the matter was, is uh, it, it, you know, these things happen so fast and furious, and, you're, and, and, and that it, it was actually a, a mistake. Um, we we yeah. wanted it, Jared is or Sam's character is supposed to be a junior in college and starting the interviewing process for uh, the interviewing process for law school, and uh, so hasn't seen him since he let. So he spent his freshman year and his sophomore year away from Dean and hasn't seen Dean. Then this is beginning of junior year. This is fall of junior year. So it's been technically two years as he's beginning the process, but because I think because what happens, you know, you guys. You know, the, the, you know, online, like sort of putting it all, the, because what happened 22 years ago, he, he was slightly older than a junior should be, so no one sort of bought that he was a junior, and so there was a lot of discussion of these two lost years, and, just, and I just like, hee hee, like, just a mistake. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We about this. Yeah. So. <laughs> but hold on, let me give the real answer. You'll find out. <laughs> now you're talking. Okay. In the back. Are there any stories about uh, the show being too scary, like you do trade-offs with the network, like they say, well, you can have two seconds of this, you know, bloody face if you do this or that? Yeah. Yeah, we've run into a few a few times that season, this season, haven't we? Oh, the night, the night, the, uh, Nightmare was the first time. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you get into really strange dis discussions of um, can we not see the decapitated Capitated head roll. <laughs> and then you start arguing about, well, can you do a half a turn? <laughs> you say, okay, you can do a half a turn, but the blood gush can't be for two seconds. It has to be for one second. Um, so those are ongoing discussions. But I, I, actually, the network's been great. We really pushed the envelope yeah. in, in every sense. And uh, they let us get away with more than I thought they would. That was also in the uh, when. The gun rig. Yeah, the gun rig with me. When yeah, I, when, the uh, ni Dean nightmare. Was shot in the, head. the episode nightmare was the, the first and only time we've ever had issues with standards and practices. And so everything else, they just were like, "Give us more." And we, again, we were shocked by that. But the, 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 there's a scene where it's a, it's a vision; it doesn't really happen. But where Dean gets his brains blown out in nightmare, and and. <laughs> And we actually rigged it, and we thought, like, you know, we rigged it so... Yeah, the rig was awesome. Yeah, you, you, you rigged it so the shot actually goes into his forehead, and, and the blood explodes out the back <laughs> under the wall. And we were like, ha ha, this is our lead, and we're just, you know... <laughs> but, and, and, and Network was like, no yeah, way. Yeah, this giant, this giant backpack filled with, like, grapes and, and corn syrup. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it was this tube just kind of coming right, right out of the back and uh, from the head on, and I had a little button in my hand, and... They just yelled action, and we timed it with a gunshot, and I hit the button and gave a reaction, and the whole wall went splat. You know? <laughs> yeah. it By was, the way, it was an awesome rig, but then they ended up having to cut to just the splat, and then back to me back with, to the, him with the hole. Yeah. But the, uh, the director of that episode is here tonight, sitting next to my wife, as it is. Phil Segrisha. Stand up. Oh, oh, really stand, stand up. Oh, stand up. <laughs> and... Uh, when I looked at those dailies, uh, and I called Phil, and I said, uh, he said, how are they, how are they? Is, you know, because Kim can tell you, all those directors are so self-confident <laughs> that we don't need constant approval or anything. Um, and he said, I said, they're great, Phil, but what the hell are you doing? And he said, well, you know, they'll look at that, and they'll give me all the rest of the stuff. So. <laughs> We actually play a game with BSP, broad, Broadcast Standards and Practice, where we cut the show and we cut it way too violent. <laughs> so then they come in and they go, well, you have to take out four frames of that shot. And you go, oh, God, not four frames. Yes, four frames. So you take it out, but you always knew that you didn't need those four frames. <laughs> so we kind of stacked the deck. Nice. Okay, there's a question over there in the corner, and there's one back there. Over there too. Oh, okay. Um, well, we've had the question about what urban myths scare you, but for those of you who are actually on set regularly, has there ever been, you know, a blood splatter or that freaky scarecrow or anything that just really creeped you out just to be around on set, even though you knew it was plastic or, you know, Caro syrup or something. I know one, and just one time randomly, we were, uh, we were filming Skin, the episode where he's a shapeshifter, and we were inside this house, this brilliant house. Yeah, it was a brilliant show. 
And um, we were inside this house, and just this clock on the wall just up and leaned over and fell off. Just this round clock. No one was near it. No one was hammering on the wall outside. It just kind of fell off, and everybody sort of looked around. But instead of kind of going, who did that? We were all just were like, ignore it and go back doing it. <laughs> Just tried, decided to not look into it any further, the way real brave people do it. Just, yeah. So the um, the show Asylum uh, was oh yeah um, yeah that was that was shot in an actual abandoned uh, mental institute, and so uh, the the halls and the rooms and and were all very used at one point and and. Uh, you know, it said that, that the crew says not to go up to the fourth floor, and then, you know, don't. And and I remember we broke for lunch, and uh, I thought I'd be, you know, clever and take a shortcut. <laughs> I I came down a stairwell and went into to one door, and it was just a long dark hallway because the, there's no <laughs> lights on. The only lights on are what the the film crew puts out, and uh, it, I was like, well, it's not that long. <laughs> I can make it. <laughs> that freaked me out. Okay. Dean Win Winchester, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Afraid of nothing. <laughs> In the back over there. Yeah. Now that there's a new network that you're probably going to be moving to, the CW, are they going to loosen up and give us a little more NC-17 like we got the Jensen storyline the other week? Bob? <laughs> I'm confused. <laughs> what? Sex. Oh, right. Uh, how can I forget? <laughs> Thank you for that, man. Sure. <laughs> Happy birthday, Chase. Yes. Happy <laughs> birthday. <laughs> Um, you know, I mean, CW is huge on full frontal male nudity, so... <laughs> well, uh, I think there's a lot in store. Stay tuned! <laughs> you know, I mean, we'll give them, you know, we'll give them love interests and uh, love stories as it's appropriate. <laughs> We're gonna need them. <laughs> um, okay, well... <laughs> Uh, take one there and one in the middle. Oh, jeez. One down here and one in the middle. Yeah, yeah, you just... Hi. Um, first of all, thanks so much for being here. Um, if you guys are always like this, can I come work on your set? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, thank y'all guys for being here. This yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly. Um, so, we came into this story uh, when the boys are already adults, and I know there's a lot to explore in the future, but I was wondering about the past, um, because I know that there's a lot of speculation about what their childhood was like growing up, um, moving around, how much Miller time Dad was doing, and mm -hmm. how Sam and Jess met, stuff like that. So, I was just wondering um, if you were going to explore that aspect of their lives. We just, uh, it's funny you say that, we just yesterday, uh, actually, I think, uh, I'm talking to Brett, who's at the network, I think you're getting a cut on Monday. Um, uh, uh, of an episode that uh, not only do the boys in, in present day you know, deal with a creature, but uh, it's a creature they dealt with in the past, and there's extensive flashbacks to uh, uh, Sam and Dean and John as, they're, you know, as the boys' children and dad, and you get to see a, uh, an element of, of what their past was like, of what their childhood was like. Um, and it was, I'm really happy with how it turned out, and it, you know, we, wa we wanted to try it once, and I think it'll be happening a lot more because there's this great... 22-year window of, of what happened, and, and, and we, that's, there's a lot of story there that you can, you can flesh out. So I, I think we're definitely going to go there, because it's coming up in, uh, I think, uh, April, that episode, and it, I, I was really pleased with how it turned out. So yeah, we're gonna Another positive is that if, if Little Sam and Little Dean are filming, Big Sam and Big Dean are sleeping. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so there's that. So yeah, keep pushing. Yeah, yeah, keep pushing. Yeah. Flashbacks. Very important. <laughs> OK. There was a question there in the middle. Okay. Dean always wears a certain necklace. Does it mean anything? You gonna hang me out to dry on this one? Oh yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we can't. Say, I mean, it does, but we can't. Yeah, say. it 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 does have significance, and it it'll. It, it, but we can't talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> 
It's from Sacramento. It's from... <laughs> 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 That's a great question, though, that you picked up on that necklace. So. Um, okay, I'm trying to spread them out. Uh, you got somebody back there? Okay, and, and then this woman down here in the red shirt. But go ahead in the back first. Um, I thought I heard you guys mention on the show one time you guys do green screen, blue screen, that kind of thing for special effects. Has that gotten a lot easier for you to do and kind of, you know, fake it? <laughs> yeah. And, um, and the second part to the question was uh, when the DVD set comes out, are you guys going to have a lot of behind the scenes jokes? Because, yeah, this is funny. <laughs> we, uh, we, we actually just had a film crew on set with us uh, this past week doing behind the scenes stuff for the DVD. So. <laughs> Going back to your first question, the green screen and, uh, and stuff, we, we do do a lot of, I said do. You said do do. You said do do. We do work a lot with. <laughs> do do. <laughs> Jared, you can take this one. Um, as Kim and Jensen were saying, we do do. And, uh, no, we do. It was, it was, I guess it was a big learning process for everybody. Just, you know, it's, it's a very interesting sort of task to be given to, especially these kind of crazy, either emotional sequences or these crazy physical sequences when they're like, all right, now um, you're in the woods and, uh, you know, you're, it's dark and it's scary and you're hearing things. And then you look behind you and there's just this big blue wall with tape and, you know, there are a couple crew guys standing back there smoking cigarettes and, you know, cursing and showing off tattoos. And so it's, it's, it's uh, I think, I've, speaking for myself, I, I hope I've gotten more of a hang of it. And aside from just the actual green screen of it, there, we can just be in a normal set and, and they're going to, um, visual effects will we'll then put in something like right. uh, Phantom Traveler with the... Uh, the smoke that would come out of the vents and, right. and, and stuff like that. That's not something that we obviously see. Um, so we have to pretend that it's there. and that There's no real green screen work going on there, but uh, there's also a, an episode coming up that Kim directed called uh, Shadows. And we deal with... Uh, yeah, it's just there. Well, what happened in well, Shadows? Well, did you see... I haven't seen it. Do you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> he loved my work. Yeah. That's uh, right. If and you remember have... the shot where Meg did the high fall. They hung her six feet off the ground, and she was picked, uh, we call it picked, with two wires on her hips. And she was looking up at the camera doing this. Hello. <laughs> she was looking up at the camera doing this. <laughs> and she just laid back, and she just laid out and flattened out. And they dropped her visually in, uh, with the computer seven stories. She never went anywhere. That was all just in one place. And then when we ran up to the window, she wasn't even there. We were actually staring at a, a big red X. Yeah. So, so Jensen, does that mean that you guys actually have to act? No, 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 no. I'm actually not here right now. <laughs> oh, I'm kidding. We're actually in Canada. This is this is. These are our body doubles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, over here. Um, I actually have two questions. The first one is, Jensen, in a past interview, um, you said you were a Christian. I was wondering, is it hard to do this kind of show, like having that background? And the other question is, in an episode, I don't remember which one it was, you gave the phone number when you're trying to reach your dad. You're like, give me a call. This is my number. But whenever you call, you can, you, you, it says, this is Dean Winchester, and it says, leave your coordinates. Did you ever hear, like, do you, can you actually leave voicemail on there? Did you hear, like, did you have a lot of fans leaving messages at that number? Because it wasn't a 555 number. It was very small to pick up on, because my sister and I, we watch it. She watches it at her place. I watch it at mine. And I was like, did you see the number? She's like, was it a real number? And so, anyway, that was my question. <laughs> If you want to actually call him, it's 800 wet legs. <laughs> That's, this is... Don't, don't give out his number. Oh, he ch Oh, you changed it? Oh, uh, scratch it. Um, I'm lost. What was the question? What? Was the question? what? Something about... You're a Christian. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, 
the first question. Uh, yes, I, I was raised uh, um, with a very uh, religious family, and and in that, uh, um, I mean, what I do. This is you know, we, we, this is acting. We're telling stories. I'm, I'm, I portray a character. Um, you know, does my grandmother cringe sometimes? Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm, I'm, you know, it's it's something that I'm cool with. Uh, and uh, and then as far as the the, the, the phone numbers and I think there's even website. There's a yeah, uh, yeah when they email. Called, yeah, every there's so actually often. been a huge response to it. Yeah, yeah, we I got know. a couple. I listened. I mean, we couldn't listen to all of them, but there was a couple thousand voicemail messages yeah. um, of people who called. And and uh, I mean, I listened to you know maybe you know thir twenty maybe or thirty of them, but 2000. some of them are hilarious. They were like, you know. Sam and Dean, there, there's a ghost in my attic. You have to come quick. <laughs> <laughs> those are those are my favorites. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Uh, whoa, whoa. Wow. <laughs> yes. Can you do that again? <laughs> <laughs> um, take one all the way in the back up there and one right here in the front. Hi, my son and I are really big fans, uh, and you guys are great. And I want to know what kind of car it is you drive. It's it's great. It's a '67 uh, Chevy Impala. <laughs> the They're gonna sell well. Yeah, <laughs> there it is. And we've got about we've just bought our fifth one. Fifth one. We got about five of them. Yeah. That's why you can't find them on eBay. Cause we, can't. <laughs> yeah. we have them all. Right there. Okay, so let's talk about the music. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. All right, I grew up in the 70s. I grew up on the mullet rock. So, yeah, yeah. let's talk about where the inspiration came from. That, with that. that was something that was really important to me uh, coming into the show, coming into the pilot. Um, you know, I'm, I'm from a small town in Ohio, and this is the music I listened to, and I was a huge, uh, huge Zeppelin fan. And, and, and so, you know, and, and so uh, when it came time to write the pilot I, and, and produce it, it was, it was so important to me that it have that music and, and not have, you know, I'll, I'll do respect to my beloved network, not have the music that's usually on that network. <laughs> Um, and, and it was so important to me, I was so like rabid about it that in the uh, original draft of the pilot, I even wrote in the, in the script, I wrote cue music and you can take your anemic alternative pop and shove it up your ass. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, the, and the reason I wrote the scene when they're in the, in the pilot, they have the scene where they're talking about tapes and he's like, you know, ACDC, you know, uh, Motorhead, Metallica. And the reason I wrote that in is I said, well, if we shoot that and it gets in the pilot, then we have to use my music <laughs> because it's already in the, it's already in the, sh it's in the show and they can't, you know, they can't put in some, you know, Sarah McLaughlin in the, in the, in the post. <laughs> so, uh, so I, you know, this is, you know, and, we, and we've had a great time. I mean, in, in, in with, you know, Phil also in, in post-production and with Bob of figuring out these songs and, and coming in one morning and being like, Ooh, Billy Squire. What about Billy Squire? <laughs> And uh, and I think it's like a real signature to the show, and and, and is is the and it's plus it's midwestern, you know, it's like two guys in, from uh, Kansas in a muscle car, and this is the music they listen to. So, um, but it's I, I mean I, I love it. There was the other night was uh, Joe Walsh, Rocky Mountain Way, and I'm just laughing my ass off. Like, yeah, Rocky Mountain Way on the WB. <laughs> It also uh, it also spreads because uh, uh, one of the editors uh, said to me, and he's a very hip guy and really good musically. He, I walk into his room, we were going through songs. I said, "Well, do this song, do this song, this song." And two days later, I walk in, he goes, "You know, Bad Company's really good." <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's take two questions from the middle. One one over there, and one on the other side. On this side, and then one on that side. Hi, I'm an inspiring actor, and I wanted to know. We're sorry. <laughs> I wanted to know um, how hard was it for you two to get started acting. Go ahead. Uh, all right, I'll feel this. It, it's a. Uh, it's not the first time I've actually heard that question, and I'm. I'm so at a loss for what to tell you. I have a very interesting story. When I was in high school, I won a contest to be on the Teen Choice Awards and hold trophies and give them to Freddie Prinze Jr. when he got 
best hottie of it's pretty the much world. been downhill since it's then. Basically right? gone downhill. <laughs> yeah, and I just <laughs> I wrote on Freddie Prince's coattails. No, um, and I, I met an agent at the uh, at the show. I met a manager actually, and and Dan Spiel I'm still with to this day. So my girl Sandy over there. Um, he we we started kind of talking over the phone with sides, and uh, he had faith in me. And I was going back to high school, and I have a mommy that's a teacher and a daddy that was an accountant, and. Uh, they were like, he's finishing high school, he's finishing high school, and I was like, why can't I go act, why can't I go act? And um, anyways, I flew out for about a week during pilot season, and I booked a pilot, and then I used that money to go out during the summer. So I had a really kind of crazy, interesting story, but I have a lot of buddies who are, you know, much more talented and, and more committed than I am that are still struggling to make it. So I, it's, a, it's a tough, tough industry, but just, you know, keep working hard and keep making yourself better. Jen, so how did you get started? Um, well, I mean, like Jared said, there's, there's really no set formula uh, for, for how we, you know, have gotten to where we've got. Um, mine was kind of a, a sheer luck thing as, as well. I was, uh, was doing theater in, in Dallas, and I happened to have a, a talent agent from, from L.A. sitting in and came up to me afterwards and gave me his, his pitch, and I said, nah, you're full of crap. And I uh, <laughs> told him to bugger off, and uh, he... And then he went up to my, my folks and kind of gave them their pitch as well. And I guess they seemed a little bit more interested. And uh, so a few years later, after um, his persistence, I, I finally said, ah, oh, maybe I'll go out there for a couple of months and check it out, see if he's, uh, see if he'll talk to talk. And uh, I came out and, and started working right away. And that was, it was about eight or nine years ago. OK. So a question on that side. First of all, um, Shadow was a kick-ass episode. And I want to thank you all for that one, because it was awesome. But let's get down to like what really matters. What alcohol do you guys like to drink? What alcohol do you got? <laughs> <laughs> because I see a lot of beers and stuff in the episode, and it's always my thing to place what y'all are drinking. So I was just wondering, are you hard guys, light guys? What do you like? <laughs> oh, my mom would kill me. Um, yeah, can we cut the tape right now? <laughs> We were rolling, check, check. Actually, one of the funny things about the, uh, about the beers is our, our prop master, Chris Cooper, um, he's, some of the beer labels, they're always fake labels. Really God? Good staple gun. Yeah, man. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they're always fake labels, and it usually has something to do with the city that we're filming that episode in. You know, like if we're in Texas, it'll be like Lone Star Lager. If we're in Minnesota, it'll be like Timberwolf Ale or something like that. But... You know, we're Texas boys, I, I think. Yeah, we, you know, we'd, we'd probably drink what you imagine a couple Texas boys would drink. Put in a cup. That's right. I have a question for you guys. Um, I'm curious if uh, this is possible to answer this question. If you could pick a scene that you either wrote or acted in or directed that's probably like your favorite scene that you've worked on since the show started, and if you could tell me why. Um, anybody want to take it? Kim, go ahead. I'll take that. Uh, Shadow, where the boys finally saw their father. Uh, there. <laughs> Shadow was, uh, I'm incredibly proud of because there were four great scenes. The scene where the boys were arming up and uh, Dean blows at Sam and says, why do you think I, I got you out of Stanford in the first place? Why do you think I came to get you? Because I want us to be family again. And uh, I'll tell you, Jensen had a tough time with that, and we kind of arm wrestled over it. And he and uh, to get him there, and uh, you know, because because Dean is, uh, you know, he's got his walls up, and, and to break down that wall for just a minute to look into Dean's heart was was magical for me. And then when they met Dad in uh, the apartment uh, and in the alley, it was just we worked very hard. Mm -hmm. The boys. They, their game of tennis improves 2,000% when they work with Jeffrey Dean or somebody like Nikki <laughs> Acox. You know, we find the nuances and, uh, it, it, and acting it becomes the crap that it is and it becomes real uh, life and the words become their own and the emotions become their own and that's special for me. And not just to say this, but having a great director to tell you exactly what to do doesn't make it hard so you know I think we, you. Jensen and I would tell you a thousand times every day that you know Kim got it out Look of his yeah, to have him. 
<laughs> hey, Jensen, did you not want to do that scene because you thought that Dean wouldn't say that? Um, yeah, sometimes I, I, I guess I can be a little protective of just of, of Dean and, and him showing emotions. And, I, you know, I always... Um, uh, and as an actor, as you grow with a character on a series, you, you really you really kind of become close to it and you, you, you protect it. Mm -hmm. uh, you protect that character and um, I guess that that was probably what, what, what that was and uh, I just didn't, I wasn't real sure how, uh, how much of the layers uh, to peel away in that scene. And I guess in that confusion I just, I, I, I kind of put up my own barrier but uh, if there was anybody to get me through it, it was Kim. So I'm glad he was there. Great. Yeah. John, you have a favorite scene? Uh, there was a moment in Skin that, that I'm proud of, and actually it, in the, it sort of says something about how we tell our stories, because we're always saying, okay, we want to do this type of episode, we want to do this monster, but how would Supernatural do it? How is it special for our show? And I remember being in, in Kripke's uh, uh, palatial office of Warner Brothers. <laughs> so f fountains. And yeah, and uh, uh, talking through the story of Skin and the shapeshifter, and obviously, you know, there's all kinds of shape-shifting that's been done on television and movies, et cetera. And, and he said, we've got to find our own. And uh, we kicked it around and came up with that scene uh, where shapeshifter Dean goes down in the sewer. And, and I remember reading a, um, uh, some online post that some friend sent me that someone else, a fan, was watching the show and giving her impressions as she watched it. Oh, my God, Dean's taking his shirt off. <laughs> and then followed immediately followed immediately by, oh my God, he's taking his skin off. <laughs> and I, and I, I knew then that, you know, we had it. And I was very, I was very pleased with that. All the things we do. Jensen, you have a scene? Um, yeah, I, I, one of my favorite, uh, um, it's not really a, a, a full scene, but it's, it's more of a shot. Um, and it was in uh, it was in Dead in the Water with uh, Kim directed, um, where I, I saved the little boy out of the lake, uh, and coming coming up out of the water, um, and that was it was just it was a, you know a slow motion shot. It was very emotional coming out of the water, and it was that was really neat. Um, but the build up to that shooting it was uh, <laughs> was really <laughs> uh, I had this. You know, ten-year-old boy in my hand, and I'm keeping both of us afloat with one one arm um, because I can't move my feet because I got two divers holding my feet below me, who are about to pull me under. And you know, I, I'm I'm fine. I grew up swimming in lakes and and all my life, but uh, to have that sensation of somebody pulling you underwater, um, especially when you've got the life of a, a ten-year-old you know little actor in your hand, and, and you're trying to keep him afloat and He's got to play dead. It was just, it was, uh, it was a little overwhelming, and and it was definitely unforgettable. But uh, we got through it, we get, and it turned out to be an awesome shot. And... That's a great story, yeah. Jack. Uh, you know what? I've had some time to think. Well, <laughs> they've answered their questions, and I'm going to go back to uh, a scene in Wendigo that we did at the very, you know, second episode of the year. And I remember there was just such a long period of time between the pilot and Wendigo. It was what, from March, April till July. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were so many questions in my head when I found out we were getting picked up, like what's gonna happen, where are we gonna start? Like how do we start, how do we finish, how do we continue this story that we started in the pilot with so many things going down? How do we keep the momentum going? And there was this one particular scene that uh, Jensen and I did on stage where he's got dad's journal, he's saying this is what it's about, and Sam is saying I gotta find dad. And I remember we, uh, we had a huge day that day. We had like eight or nine pages of dialogue and uh, Jensen and I realized that we had to do this scene. We're like, oh crap, like what? <laughs> like, let's go memorize it, my trailer. We sat down in my trailer, and there was an acting coach that I, I work with whenever I can named Cameron Thorpe there with us. And, uh, you know, he kind of pushed and prodded me a little bit, and I don't know what he did to Jensen, but uh, <laughs> we, we were. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. It was noisy. <laughs> <laughs> Never again. That's between y'all and the wall. But anyways, we ended up, we ended up kind of getting the scene and, and putting something there. And I, I think um, it was one of the first times I ever felt like um, I, was, I was hopefully doing what Kripke wanted, you know? Like, I think, like, I felt like, you know, I think this is what Eric was envisioning. Like, I really felt, for some reason, there's one of those times when you finish a scene and you're like, wow, like, I don't know where that came from, but 
I don't know, whatever. I remember seeing the dailies on that too. We were just through the roof. It was incredible. Bob? Uh, I think uh, my favorite scene is a really quiet scene, and it's at, um, it's at the end of uh, the Faith episode. And, and that whole episode was really about, I think, very topical for today, about what's, what's real faith. And uh, Julie Benz comes in, has a uh, scene with Jensen, and uh, Jensen says to her, um, I'm, I'm not much for praying, but I'll, I'll pray for you. And she said, well, that's a miracle right there. And uh, I, I thought that kind of, I thought it was really sweet. I thought it was incredibly well acted uh, with both Julie and Jensen. And I thought that it, um, it probably, if people were listening, I think that probably was our, you know, our finest moment to uh, say something semi-political and, and, and be um, on the right side of that. I just hope it affected people the way it affected me. Um, I, I agree with all of those. All of those are incredible scenes. I would also add uh, the scene when uh, uh, Dean first calls his father in home and tells him to come to Lawrence and just the way that Jensen was able to try to put up those walls, but the walls kept breaking down, and that was amazing. But all those amazing scenes aside, everyone's given such classy answers. Um, I have to say that when the, when the dude stuck his hand in the disposal... <laughs> In, in home, <laughs> and, and then the monkey starts clapping, and, and we had that shot beneath the sink, and you could actually see all the goo come out. And I said, I, and we shot it in dailies. I said they'll never let us use that, and we used it. And uh, it's it's more probably than any other scare sequence in the show. It's the one that people watch, and yeah. they just they can't even you know keep their eyes on the screen. And you know, to me, that's sort of the fun of getting the effect out of the audience. So I'm going to say the garbage disposal scene in home. <laughs> It's great because that explains what Bob was talking about before with the two different See, approaches. See, there you go. All right. Okay, I want to thank you guys. You guys have been a great audience. Can I say uh, one? Uh, before you go, before you go, don't go yet. I also want to thank, first of all, Eric's got something to say. Well, I just want to say uh, we have a lot of uh, the people who work in, on Supernatural in the audience, and I want a round of applause for them for this unbelievable season. All of them have done such a... They've all... They've all murdered themselves to, to bring you this show, and, and we couldn't do it without any of them. So, so thank you to them. We, it's, and I, I also want to, hope thank, so. I want to thank you guys, all of you, for not just being here tonight, but also for the great work that you're doing. Thank and you. uh, you're obviously touching our floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.